So you missed out on a great dinner the other day. I had. Yes. I'm sorry to have missed that. But we did celebrate your award while, while you were out traveling. So I understand you went back to uh, visit your mom. Yeah, I went back to um, England, which is where I'm originally from. So that's why I have this slightly strange accent. Fascinating um, accent. I wasn't yeah. going to say it was from New York or California or, or something. Or Australia. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this episode of Equipping the Core. Today, our guest is Deb Olson. She's Joint Program Manager at Protection Program Executive Officer Kim Bio. It's a very long title, so I will leave it at that. Deb is the recent recipient of the Donald Roebling Award for her work as Program Manager, Engineering Systems at our Logistics Combat Element Systems. She led an initiative resulting in the divestment of more than 47,000 pieces of equipment valued at over $3.4 billion. Deb, welcome. Before we get started, would you mind giving our uh, listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came about coming to uh, Marine Corps Systems Command? No, well, thank you uh, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. I'm hoping I uh, I can do a good job through this podcast, my first attempt at fame. Well, that makes two of us yeah. then, so. <laughs> uh, so I've been around the command since... Uh, 2003 I started as a uh, as a contractor and then in 2005 uh, moved to the government side of the house kind of worked my way up um, through the organization starting as a program analyst team lead um, to a product manager and I started on the IT side of the house so oh, I, uh, okay. I spent 13 years um, okay. and I I then decided it was time for a change and uh, I saw the opportunity to move to sort of more the ground side. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2015, I uh, I moved to be Jack Cave's deputy as combat support systems and okay. that kind of began, you know, the last six years of my, my program management quest on the ground side. But how I came to the command is kind of interesting. So um, actually having my third daughter at Fort Belvoir, I met a lady across from me who was having her third son, who uh, ended up being a product group director here. We hadn't ever met before. Uh, you know, we were all veterans of childbirth, so we kind of got along pretty well. And uh, she was like, oh, you have a master's in IT. You should, you should come to work for the Marine Corps. And um, so she put me in touch with some contractors around the place, and that's how I ended up uh, here. So it's amazing how uh, what a small world it is and how things work. So I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps and I had no idea or no vision that I would ever be involved in anything uh, called acquisition, uh, particularly acquisition in the Marine Corps. So uh, it gives you a whole different perspective in life when, uh, you know, you uh, finally look behind the wall and see what it takes to get some of this moving. So. Well, we're glad you're here. You're an award winner. You've done a lot for this command. You've been involved in uh, some great programs, uh, particularly on the logistics team. And over the course of the last year or so, you took on a greater venture as uh, the new commandant came in and he came out with this vision of force design and, and the way ahead. Part of the discussion was we had to divest of some of our older equipment in order to modernize the core. And I think these have been some, some pretty outstanding years that we we we've had the last two, three years and in, in, in the foreseeable years ahead, and how we move into, how we transition into this modernization. But I think one of the things that I'm hoping our listeners get is to the complexities of not only moving into a modernized Marine Corps, but what it takes to divest of gear that's been around for the last 20 or 30 years. Can you share a little bit with us on some of the gear and equipment that you were tasked with uh, divesting? Sure. So we, um, so in my prior role as a program manager for engineer systems, the engineer and EOD community saw a huge shift with force design, more, more so on the combat engineer side of the house and the associated divestment with that. But actually, a little bit before force design, um, we were also, um, we had an, an MROC, the Marine Corps Requirements Oversight Council came up with a decision memorandum to kind of right size the Bravo TAMs. Right, right. So the Bravo TAMs are all mostly, for the most part, they're um, engineer um, systems TAMs. 
So we kind of got a little bit of a head start on on divestment there. Through the wars in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, we actually saw a significant increase in our Bravo TAMs, in the AAOs for some of our really big equipment, material handling, construction equipment, um, some of the utilities stuff. So as we were building those big kind of forward operating bases, we, you know, the, the demand increased for our gear. Then as we shifting, we start to see the drawdown from that. Then we also, as a result of that, they were like, hey, we need to right size these Bravo TAMs. We know we, we have too much. Right, right. So we got a little bit of a head start um, on, on the divestment associated with force design um, back in, um, it was right at the end of 2019. And that was largely focused, I would say, um, sort of more so on that, on that really heavy equipment set. And then as we moved into Force Design 2030 and sort of that, you know, the divestment to invest. So it wasn't just about the equipment, but also, you know, how many people do we have working on the team at the command that, you know, we're, we're kind of, a lot of our systems to some extent were on life support. So we were putting fiscal, and uh, I should say personnel resources against them where right, there may right. not be fiscal resources too. So as we... Uh, as we started to look at this, at this MROC DM, I basically kind of said, you know, stop, let's wait a minute and let's take a look at this holistically because we knew force design was coming too and this was going to be larger than just some onesie twosie right, di right. divestments. So we were divesting of power equipment, so generators and floodlights, uh, fuel systems, water systems, um, mobility, counter mobility systems. Some EOD, but not quite as much, but then also mm -hmm. material and material handling and construction equipment too. So it really kind of, it, it cut across our portfolio and engineer systems as a whole. But we also, with force design, we saw this kind of vertical cut, if you will, of capability. So when you consider sort of assured mobility and, uh, and um, route clearance, those capabilities right. were completely divested of. So we actually ended up divesting of an entire team um, within our organization at the same time too. So did you see those resources, uh, you know, obviously talk personnel and the teams that had to be drawn down. Did you see those resources realigned to uh, other organization, those skill sets being brought somewhere else? Yeah, so on, on our side of the house, um, on the acquisition side, you know, some of those resources went to higher priority programs mm -hmm. and then some remained in place because the divestment effort as a whole, you know, it, it's, it's easy to say divest, but there's a lot of work that goes on on the back end of that to make sure that it happens and it happens in a way that is, you know, efficient and really supports the, the FMF as well. And, and I think that's uh, so I, in my mind, you kind of hit on a, a key element there, because I think the, the common person would think of you getting rid of trucks and equipment and things. You just give them away, you sell them, you park them, you, you do something with it. But there really is a lot more to it than that, uh, depending on the capability. Can you touch on that a little? Some of the challenges that perhaps you encounter? Yeah, sure. Uh, I know the Marine Corps has... Uh, you know, for years now, I've been divesting of some of its Humvees and, and some of its heavier trucks mm -hmm. that it no longer uses. But can you touch a little bit on, on what goes on? Yeah, so we had, like, in total about 47,000 pieces of gear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, as I said, it sort of it, it spanned the capabilities of the engineer and e EOD portfolio. But there are so many different ways to divest. Right, so. Right. You know, what we looked at was, okay, so can another service use it, you know, return it to the PICA, the primary inventory control activity. Is Thanks for clarifying that that acronym for our listeners, by well, the way. Hopefully it was right. It is, it is. I, <laughs> I myself get confused on them. So. <laughs> uh, and then the other one was, uh, well, well, one of the other ones was foreign military sales. Mm -hmm. Then there's other um, agencies. So, for example, um, we had uh, the EOD guys had some robots that they didn't want anymore, but the FBI wanted them. So there was a transfer opportunity there. And then there is um, something called equipment exchange, which we use very heavily, which is our opportunity to basically work with a, a company called Iron Planet, or if there are others out there, but predominantly it's uh, it's Iron Planet, and they um, are able to auction 
our commercial equipment and then give us an exchange credit back. No money changes hands, but they give us a credit that we can then say, hey, we want to go and buy this other piece of equipment instead. Um, and then finally, you know, we, it goes to Derma, we just dispo of it. But for each of those, you know, everything requires kind of that analysis to determine the best disposition path for it and then the disposition instructions that go along with it any uh, you know if we need to you know remove any armor mm -hmm. from uh, vehicles or equipment so that they can you know go to the their final place whether that be equipment exchange or um, through you know Dermo DS. So it's interesting you mentioned the equipment ex exchange and I had some visibility on it few years ago but for our listeners when we part with some of these Humvees or perhaps even some of our uh, older truck systems mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned we, we commonly refer to the term as demilitarizing uh, the piece of gear before mm -hmm. it goes out there so I can actually go on a site and, and buy a former Marine Corps Humvee but I'm not going to get a, an armored Humvee right. to drive up and down the street That's correct. Uh, so it, it's uh, it, it, it's interesting I've seen those out there so perhaps our listeners now have a b better idea where those come from. Have you worked with some of the other services in divesting their gear, or is it strictly Marine Corps equipment? We have, uh, you know, in the very early days of doing it, you know, we have kind of educated other services in those areas. It kind of depends to some extent as well, how, you know, how quickly they want to divest of equipment and, uh, you know, how many resources they want to put against it. I would say now, you know, we were kind of ahead of the army in our um, equipment exchange, mm -hmm. but then they also moved out. You can do, there is a sale authority too, where funds mm -hmm. can come back. We've never really approached it that way, but the army has cracked the nut on now on, you know, getting actual, you know, money back in the coffers for them to use uh, to purchase new equipment. Uh, but we, we've talked to them, we've talked to the Navy, but we've never um, sort of taken on that role for them, if you will. It was more of a sharing of information and education. So and speaking anything. speaking about the Navy, I know, uh, so you mentioned the PICA earlier. I know uh, we do a lot with the Navy, obviously, mm -hmm. but we're responsible for some of their gear as well, too. Some of their uh, vehicles uh, and engineering gear. Is that anything that crosses your portfolio? No, mostly dealing with the army. The army the, was the peaker on a lot of our, um, you know, our bridging, breaching, some of our, our heavy equipment too. Uh, the Navy did buy off of our contracts for service life extension of our material handling construction equipment. I'm trying to think back, there may be um, a couple of that we, you know, specifically had that we were the peaker for, but um, mostly on the army side. So. A lot of the equipment that we divested of, we actually gave back to the army. Okay. And so, um, I shouldn't say we gave back, but they had a they had a need for it. And as the Pika, we returned it to them. For example, the assault breacher vehicle, uh, we returned all of those. They were a pretty low density item for us. They still were doing depot maintenance. They still had a requirement for them. Um, bridging, there was a lot of bridging that we gave back to the army as well. And that was one of the ones where it was like you know. The uh, the FMF, you know, rightly so, are kind of trying to get things off their lot, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to maintain them anymore. So there's quite a lot of negotiation there because the army weren't ready to accept and they didn't know exactly how many they wanted and where they wanted them. And then there was a transportation cost issue. So there were a lot of things that we had to negotiate, but, you know, kind of keeping the FMF informed, like, hey, they are leaving your lot. <laughs> <laughs> you just, can you hold on another minute or two and we can we can get them out the door. So, so it's not like a big yard sale and come down and get your stuff. So a lot of agencies are involved in doing all of this. I know the Marine Corps has a lot of pre-position equipment mm -hmm. in uh, various places uh, around, around the globe. Uh, were you uh, tasked with handling some of the coordination for for that as well? Yeah. And so, what were some of your challenges or? Uh, well, I guess the challenges on the prepo side is you've got to wait for the equip the ship to come back in to right. get the equipment off. One of the things we did is we saw this coming down. Is I wrote an LOI um, that basically you know to my team that said you know divestment is going to be one of our you know. Our main focuses and I knew there was it was unlikely that this could be 
another duty is assigned or, you know, the logisticians have got a lot right. of work going on. So we actually ma- pulled someone out of a team. We made them the divestment lead. And that was the your sort of one sole job in life was to coordinate the divestment of all of this equipment. So, um, so was this the uh, divestment integrated product team that you established as well? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So that was a an IPT that really... I mean, it was kind of more of a question like who wasn't on that IPT than who was on it because we had great participation. And so, you know, working very closely with um, CD&I, obviously, from a requirement standpoint, you know, to get the to get to the right AAO and the right divestment amount. Um, INL, LPE, who were kind of, um, that's the engineer side of the house, who were really um, also coordinating with the FMF. And then, uh, you know, one, two, three, MEF, the reserves, mm-hmm. uh, Logcom, down at Blunt Island for, um, you know, pre-positioning, uh, folks out in Barstow as well. So we would have a, a call um, in the beginning. It was kind of every once a week, you know, every Monday we'd get on the phone and we'd, be, we'd, we'd run down the list mm-hmm. of all the divestments, what the plans were, when they could accept, expect to see the the actual, you know, the formal divestment plan and disposal plan come out, um, helping them, you know, and a lot of times, um, not trying to toot our horn, our own horn too much, but we, uh, we kind of know more about the posture of the equipment set mm-hmm. that's out there because we took our role very seriously from sort of a, a life cycle, you know, support um, of, of the equipment. So we would know you know, what the best pieces of equipment were, what the hanger queens were. So we would be telling the FMF a lot of times, hey, hold on to this piece of gear, give this one up, you know, WIR this one. And also what we knew in our sort of our system versus what you might see in, in, in TIFSMAS and some of those other um, systems were, were different. So, so a lot those, of times those we, are, uh, you're talking about equipment tracking systems right. that uh, the Marine Corps has in place. Right. So we, we kind of had a, a little bit of a head start of that. So sometimes it was the systems kind of catching up with with what we knew to be the, the true, true and accurate posture and readiness um, of those systems. So, so if I could jump in here just to clarify something for our listeners that maybe helps. So part of the acquisition process is we literally take a piece of gear from what we say cradle to grave. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, we're also responsible for the life cycle and the sustainment of this piece of gear until we see it out the door. So when you talk about the fact that you're kind of ahead of the team a little bit on that, uh, you, you have a different kind of a different map that you're looking at where that piece of gear should be. So it gives you a little bit of advantage in the field. Right. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is, uh, so the Marine Corps has two logistic space sites one of them you mentioned which was barstow and the other one being uh albany Mm -hmm. so a lot of the coordination a lot of the equipment eventually ends up there for divestment Mm -hmm. uh, or reappropriation depending on on where it's headed so uh you did a lot of coordination with those folks uh as well yeah so when we used equipment exchange we tried to our goal was to get everything off the off the lots mm-hmm. at the MEFs because, you know, we reduce transportation costs back to okay. Albany. Um, it's kind of out of their hair, so they don't have to worry about that coordination. So to the maximum extent, when it was fleet gear, we tried to take it from the fleet. But we also, you know, as they reduce numbers from, uh, you know, float allowances for the depot down in Albany um, and then the Wormer, the war reserve numbers as well. We would take them directly from Albany too. So there's a lot of coordination to get. So we have to get, uh, if especially if it's equipment exchange, we have to get, you know, the contractor onto the base to take photos, to assess the gear, to tell us what they think it would, you know, its market value might be and that kind of thing. So, I mean, the fleet were great. You know, they, they we, we got the process down pretty tight uh, to get them on the lots and to get them, you know, to, to understand what gear we wanted to, to exchange and, and what it was worth. So. so obviously, as we as we talked about it before, a lot of this started pre-COVID. So I have to ask you the inevitable question. I mean, obviously, COVID came in and kind of put a damper on a lot of things and, and kind of adjusted how we did business. 
Uh, what were the impacts to uh, uh, to you and, and, and the team uh, as you, you were challenged with some of this divestment? Well, I think we were kind of, to some extent, ahead of the curve. Okay. So the plans were in place. It certainly slowed us down in the divestment from 3MEF. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we worked closely with the vendor to, um, because there were kind of two ways to look at it. You know, do we ship all the gear back right, so right. that they can, you know, basically assess it here? Um, or do we do we send them to 3MF, let them take a look at it, let them be responsible mm -hmm. for transportation, and then kind of negotiate the, the end exchange agreement, which is what we did, which saved us a considerable amount of time um, and then resources as mm -hmm. well to do that. But we didn't, I, I would say in large part, uh, we kind of hit the bow wave uh, a little bit ahead of COVID um, for for what we, you know, our approach for divestment. Right, right. Uh, so it didn't slow us down too much. That's awesome. So looking back on, I mean, obviously this is a, a huge undertaking. I mean, we had, uh, you know, 47,000 pieces of equipment were over $3.4 billion, billion with a B. It takes a lot to move all of this. So have you had time to digest what you've done now that you've transitioned onto a new position? And if so, can you look back and say, hey, was there something I should have done different? Have I taken away a lot of lessons? Or do you have things you'd like to share with others as they take on similar mountains? Yeah. Uh, well, I would say that, well, first of all, I mean, it was kind of the team did it, right? So I was just the, the, the PM. So it was really, uh, you know, Tony Boltus was the, the divestment team lead. Uh, Sean Watson was uh, our APM logistician. We had Mike Roberts down in Albany. So we had a lot of mm -hmm. core folks who really, you know, did, did the heavy lift of this. I think what made us successful is we really did understand where our gear was. And we have great relationships with with the fleet. Um, so the combat engineer community is pretty, you know, not, not pretty, that big. You know, we're pretty tight. Close, close yeah, knit community, we're, we're tight. Absolutely. You know, we folks, you know, talk all the time. I had like my leadership was, you know, all empowering. Hey, go take care of this. You know, just keep telling us how you keep us updated. Let us know how you're doing. So I think that that um, that really helped. I don't know necessarily what we would we would have done differently because we had a little bit of a head start, right? right, right. So we had that initial MROC DM that kind of like got Decision us thinking. Memorandum. Yeah, that got us thinking and doing um, in terms of right sizing the TAMs ahead of force design. So I would say that potentially, you know, if you had a crystal ball, it would be really being able to say, okay, on the back end, what do we want to do with these exchange credits, right? right? right. So the community as a whole um, on the combat engineer side of the house is really trying to figure out what its role is going to be in force design mm -hmm. and the kind of capabilities that they're going to need. So at the last, they call it an engineer summit, sort of analogous to an OAG. Right. You know, we really had this, uh, and that was in April of this year, we talked about where we wanted to go with experimentation. Mm -hmm. And so they're really leaning forward into developing this experimentation plan. So sort of to come back around to this divest to invest, right? right? right. So what we're looking at the um, the equipment exchange credit is for is, okay, we've, we've got these credits, now where do we use them? And the community wants to lean forward in, into using them to experiment with different capabilities, to look at how they modernize, you know, how they're more littoral, how they integrate more with the Navy, you know, more, some a lot of those um, EABO, you know, like capabilities that they really need um, in order to uh, support, you know, in the MLR. So a good opportunity to maybe break away a little bit from a, a traditional program, a record, a, and experiment with areas that may be evolving or, or, right. or extremely beneficial to uh, the engineering community in the future. So uh, I have had uh, some conversations with other programs where they've taken similar exchange, uh, for instance, a, a vehicle with a, with a turret mount on it, where they're you know, you traded in all these old Humvees and now you have credit that allows you to buy new turret mm -hmm. rings and things that are yeah. uh, similar to that. So just to give our, our listeners a, a little bit more insight on uh, what it means to do an exchange uh, 
uh, with some of these uh, with some of these systems uh, and capabilities that we're divesting of. I do have to ask the question: Did you have any? Uh, I know we've divested of tanks and a few other things, but did you play a role at all, either providing guidance or direction to the teams who had to do those as well? I think very early on, you know, when we first started sort of leaning forward on equipment exchange, you know, we were we were working with the, the, the PEO teams on those as well, but everyone's got it down pat now. Okay. So uh, we're there if anybody wants to come, <laughs> and, come and ask questions, but uh, it's a very... Very simple, uh, amazingly simple thing to be able to do. And I guess that was going to be, uh, that, that kind of leads me into uh, my next question, which is, you know, what, what advice would you have for, for these other teams uh, who have some of the same challenges or requirements of them now as we continue to progress forward to uh, Force Design 2030? Yeah, I think depending on the, the the scale of the divestment, I think you have to you pull it out separately. Like you have to make it its own separate focus and mm -hmm. and track it and almost treat it like it's its own program, it's which is which is what we did for us engaging with the fleet. You know, um, talking. You know, making sure that they they had an open line of communication back through to us. So like, hey. What about this piece of gear? What about this? And then it's also being kind of a little bit patient too, because oftentimes, you know, we're, things may be slated for divestment, mm -hmm. but they're still exercising with right. it, right? So, I, and I mean, it's a, it's, it can be an emotional event for them to lose, you know, certain pieces of gear, especially when they're losing a whole capability, like assured mobility for, for the combat engineers, you know, route reconnaissance and clearance. It's something they, they now, you know, they they no longer do it because they don't have the capability. So it's it's trying to work through some of that too to get it it you know, sometimes you're prying it out of their hands just just a little bit. But then also to be able to demonstrate to them that on the back side of that that something else is coming. Um, I think is important. I, I can certainly understand that. Uh, Marines we're we're a little finicky. We get attached to our gear. I probably tell you my team has the same problem with me. I get attached to certain old programs and things that I just don't want to let go of. Uh, I certainly don't want to let go of my old truck parked in the, the driveway, but my wife wants me to get rid of it. So <laughs> it it, it, uh, it definitely, uh, I can see where that would be challenging. What was the feedback from the, the fleet, your interactions with Marines? Uh, I know, you know, I know there's some obstacles they get, attached to things and whatnot, but what, what was the overall consensus as we ventured down? So if you had to take a look at how they feel about force design and doing away with new gear, transition to new new equipment. I think overall it was positive in so far as they wanted that equipment gone so they didn't have to maintain it anymore. And they, you know, they were getting pushed very hard as well to, to get stuff off their lots. So... Um, I think them having other, you know, having the enterprise as a whole and being able to, you know, for us to be able to communicate that picture to them and they weren't on their own was helpful. Um, I think, you know, that that there is some concern in the engineer community because they don't really know what's coming in behind right. it. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of, of that that period of discomfort right? Right, right where they where they're concerned that they don't have the capability anymore and what's that going to look like in the future but overall i think our engagement has is always pretty positive and yeah. and we've got good feedback so or, or no feedback which sometimes is good feedback yeah. well you did mention there was a lot of gear early on there were some things that we had on life support and whatnot yeah. and i you know, given the fact that we've been involved in these uh, these wars for the last 20 years, uh, Marines are expeditionary in nature, but we spent a lot of time uh, kind of landlocked for a while. Mm -hmm. So probably uh, put a put a strain on on some of this gear that maybe wasn't meant to last as long as, as they were able to make it last or as long as your team was able to make it last. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been extremely informative, and I think it's fascinating to understand what goes into, uh, it's not just park the vehicle out in the desert and uh, you leave it there until it either rots out or whatnot. So you actually put a lot of this equipment uh, to hopefully future use, whether it's through the 
equipment exchange uh, or just divesting gear that no longer had a shelf life uh, with it. Uh, but it's fascinating. You've made a transition now. You're on to uh, bigger and better things under a different program. Can you tell us just a little bit about your new position and uh, some of the things you're looking forward to? I can try. I've only been there a few weeks and I'm uh, I'm drinking from the fire hose. Well, we're so. going to let you get settled there for a while before we bring you back and talk more about this. But I think it'd be kind of neat to let our audience know where you're headed and uh, what you're looking forward to doing. Yeah, so I am... Um, as you said in the beginning, it's a mouthful. The joint program manager, <laughs> joint program executive office for ChemBio. So I'm still a, uh, a Marine Corps employee. Mm -hmm. So it's a Marine Corps position there as a, and the, the Army vernacular is just a little different. So PM in my world, my new world is, is a, a project manager. So I'm still um, ADCON to the Marine Corps, but I'm OPCON to the Army, who is the executive agent for um, for the Joint Program Office. So I work for a senior executive called Dr. Roos, who has uh, three JPMs under him, um, and then three uh, JPL, Joint Program Leads. We have mm -hmm. another one, Mike Poe is one of right. them, on the, the soft side of the house. So I have about 150 folks who are sort of matrixed across the services. Okay. Um, so this so, is all services, by the way, not yeah. just the Army and Marine Corps? Yeah. Okay. Um, all services, so buying protection equipment, um, you know, protective suits, gloves, masks, containers, uh, decontamination systems, uh, and the such like. That's about as far as I can... Uh, I, I can exert my, I, my I, knowledge I think, of it. Right I think now. we're good there. I, we'll, we'll we'll at least give you a few months or a year or so, and we'll bring you back so you can clarify to us what it is that you think you're doing. Right. So there is one more thing I'm going to ask you to do before we let you go. All right. Uh, and we 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 call this our lightning round. I'm going to ask you a few questions and uh, see if I can stump you or or get some fascinating responses from oh, you. Oh, you'll get fascinating responses, uh -oh. I'm sure. All right. So let's start with the first one. What's your favorite vacation spot? Oh, well, that's not fair, because every vacation ah. I have to go back to England. Ah. So it's not really a vacation. <laughs> it's more of a uh, like a second job ah, uh, okay. to see the family. So I would still have to say England, though, because I never go anywhere else more than once. So. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Number two here. Yeah. Uh, what's a TV show, a book? a movie, or a podcast, besides this podcast, that you would recommend? Oh, can I do two of... Absolutely. All right. I'll even let you do three if uh, if the last one is recommending this okay, podcast. Okay, so podcast, my yes. friend just turned me on to this. It's called Sawbones. Yeah. S-A-W-B-O-N-E-S. Yeah, okay. You know what? It's really good. Um, so yeah. it's uh, it's a, um, a husband and wife um, kind of like podcast show. And the wife is a doctor and the husband is just kind of funny. Um, and they talk about like different medical histories. Oh, wow. So they talk about like many different things. Of The first episode was about drilling into people's skulls. Wow, fascinating. It, it's, it's actually really good. It's really interesting, but it's really funny at the same time. So I quite like it because it's a little bit of both. Um, so I highly recommend that. Okay. And then for TV shows, I never used to watch TV until COVID. Because I was always kind of like, I was at, at work, driving to work, right, you right, know, right, right. get home. Um, and for those of you who are not in Northern Virginia, I mean, just driving to and from can be, you know, half your day sometimes. That's so, right. anyway, so um Line of Duty. Have you watched it? Line of Duty. I have not. Oh, it is a, well, it's a British show. Uh, not okay. that there's a theme here, because okay. I do no, like other, other shows. But um, it is about an anti-corruption unit in the UK that oh. goes um, look, basically like weeds out bent coppers, they're called. Oh. So, and a copper is a, a policeman in England. I and do know that Bent one. means that you're not straight. So ah. you, are, you are not conforming. Uh, number three, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? So like right this minute or yeah. like in general? In general, if you weren't doing this acquisition thing, what would you be doing? 
I don't know. I always, flying around the world, you know. I always wanted to do something in the medical profession. Okay. But I was never really, I wasn't a good student in school. Thus your attraction to Sawbone. The, yeah, oh, that's got right. It, got it. So I always wanted to uh, to do that when I was younger. But if it was right now, I'd be riding my horse because it's a beautiful day. Yeah, so, fascinating. Uh, yeah. This is the one that gets everybody, I think. So this is actually my favorite. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? This is a tough one. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, we were talking about this the other day, and I would thought it would be really good to be invisible, but then somebody else it would be thought it'd be better to be able to do time travel, and they convinced me. So I'm gonna go with uh, with time travel, so I could travel forward and see whether or not my programs worked out, <laughs> and then I could travel backwards and fix the problem before it got there. So that's outstanding. I think mine, uh, yeah, my team has alluded to the fact that invisibility is probably mine. <laughs> Most of the time they don't pay attention that I'm even here. So, but with that said, listen, it's been fantastic. I really enjoyed the conversation. Hope to have you back on uh, and have a conversation at another, another date about another topic. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes, leave us a review, subscribe, tell your friends about us. Till next time, Manny Pacheco signing off.